I've noted quite a few times on this channel that the most expensive part of toy making is the injection molded plastic tool. This is the giant metal case, the metal mold, think like an old Play-Doh mold we had as kids. These are used to create anything made of plastic. It has to come out of a injection molded plastic machine. And these things cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is why you see toy companies doing repaint after repaint after repaint because, well, quite frankly, when you've invested $100,000 in a toy mold, you want to amortize your value and you want to be able to maximize the investment. And that's why we see a lot of things that as collectors we feel are cheap repaints. Well, nothing looks like more of a sort of inexpensive solution than when we give kids paper as a toy. This is often done because, well, paper doesn't require an injection molded tool and can be, well, as simple as including paper. Now, let's get something straight. Kids do love paper and cardboard and cardstock and all of the different, you know, variations of paper, if you will. Because, well, paper and cardboard represents unlimited potential. I mean, come on. There is nothing cooler as a child than getting a giant box. Right? I mean, especially like a really big one, like a refrigerator box or something. The things you can turn this into, all it takes is a little imagination, and suddenly a box becomes a spaceship, or a rocket car, or a rocket car spaceship, or any of those three. And maybe you have a very talented parent who can take a box and turn it into something amazing. I'm not one of those, but my father was actually pretty good and built me quite a few forts, and even I remember building some He-Man harnesses, like vests, out of cardboard and swords and helmets as a kid. I loved them. One of the other things I loved about paper product were actually the boxes for my toys. Not just because they had colorful dioramas on them and showed all of the, you know, figures in action and what the toy looked like as if it was kind of part of the movie, but... As an example, when I got the AT AT, or as people call it today, the AT AT, even though that's, you know, completely not correct, we all know it's an AT AT, right? Well, I was more excited to get the box than anything. And why was that? Because it had this a poocha poocha seal, or a poofa percha seal. I called poocha poocha when I was a kid. Yep, you could cut these out, mail them away for free figures. And I was more excited to get the box that had like double proof of purchase points because the AT AT, excuse me at at was so big and getting even more proof of purchase points because it was so big was even more exciting to me as a five-year-old than getting the actual toy. So I, as soon as I opened it, I flipped it over and I was, instead of going like, wow, thank you, I just got this awesome Imperial Walker. Instead, I was like, hey, I got proof of purchase points. Now, fast forward to today and we're seeing paper product taken to the next level, literally included as action figure accessories. And again, this is done because, well, it doesn't require tooling, and a great way to save on the overall cost of a figure is to essentially slip in a piece of paper and pass that off as one of the action figure's legitimate accessories and piece count. So while this is cool in, you know, theory, I guess one could say, there's been some ups and downs. One of the uh, cooler versions of a paper accessory that I saw in the last few years was when Hasbro had the Indiana Jones license following the Temple of the Four... Not the Forbidden Eye, that's the Disney ride, excuse me. The uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. See, I can name my Indiana Jones stuff. And all of the action figures came with a paper cardboard crate that included a paper sticker and a plastic piece of architecture or archaeology or... It had a thing. It had like a jewel or, or, you know, an ancient relic. See, you can see some of them here with their stickers and crates. And it was kind of cool because it was part of the mystery of what you were going to get. It was very, you know, on brand with Indiana Jones, especially because, you know, crates showed up in Raiders of the Lost Ark in the final scene. So you could create your own warehouse and stack them. Another example was when Star Wars went from including actual pack-ins to just giving people packets of paper. The reason this was done is as the prices continued to increase, Hasbro necessarily and logically felt the need to somehow plus up the figure to compensate for the fact that the SRP kept increasing. So, case in point, the original Power of the Force Chewbacca just came with Chewbacca. Well, a year or two later, when the price point went up from $4.99 to $5.99 in order to show price value, a slide was included. And then before Episode 1, the slides were offered as flashback photo, which also was 
made of paper, although it did have some plastic. And then finally for episode one and what was going to be the next iteration of Power of the Force were the ComTech chips, which were not paper at all. They were electronic, and you actually had to buy as a separate purchase the device that would let you unleash the magic of the ComTech, which was the ComTech reader. But as I can probably tell by the uh, inflection in my voice, these weren't exactly embraced by kids, and uh, they were dropped in favor of something even less tooling intensive, which again was the piece of paper, the Jedi Force file, that was included in the Power of the Jedi line, replacing the slide, the Force file, and the ComTech chip as your bonus added value to compensate from the fact that the figures were now $6.99. So essentially you were getting the same figure, and a price value inclusion was going to help parents, kids, and collectors overcome that price increase. But when the pack-in item became simply a fold-out piece of paper, well, the price value increase really wasn't seen. Yeah, it was cool to be able to read about your favorite character and learn, you know, where they fit into the Star Wars universe, how smart they were, how much endurance they had, who their friends and enemies were, their spaceships, their gear, etc., etc., and some summaries of their greatest adventures? Sure, why not? But again, you're really only dealing with a piece of paper, and nowadays, if it's not on a screen, kids really aren't interested in learning about it. So something like this was really just a way of adding value without increasing tooling. I think paper product as toy culminates in Nintendo's attempt to sell kids cardboard toys that could integrate with the Nintendo in form of the Labo line. So this was a toy line where you would buy sheets of cardboard and be given instructions on how to fold them into different objects that could then incorporate things like a Nintendo Switch actually into the cardboard foldout. So, as exciting as it was, getting a blank piece of cardboard where it told you exactly how to fold it and exactly how to turn it into a toy, it kind of lacked the magic of just taking a box and turning it into something. Sure, Labo had deep instructions on how to make a working piano that incorporated the Nintendo Switch as the electronics portion, but it was basically not really... Well, <laughs> if it worked, we'd still see it at retail, put it that way. And again, like communism, paper products as toys are great in theory, but in the real world, not so much. While it was marketed as a great family, you know, son, dad, mom, daughter, family time toy, it, the magic just really wasn't there. And toys can have magic and paper, but Labo kind of crashed and burned because it was giving you the cardboard and telling you how to make it, as opposed to... Something like this, where a child just has a box and lets their imagination create the castle. I mean, it might take a little help from mom and dad to create the turrets or the opening, but wow, there was something just so special about being able to turn an ordinary box into things like armor and castles and forts, because there were no instructions, and you were doing it based on your imagination. And that is exactly the key to what I would call paper play. Paper works great when it is essentially powering a child's imagination. When you are force-fed paper and told that this is an action figure accessory, or a pack-in added value, or we're going to give you instructions on exactly how to origami this into a product that could incorporate electronics, well, that's not what inspires play. Now, while we're seeing more and more action figures coming with paper product, thinly disguised as an accessory, it really is, at the end of the day, a way for a company to save on tooling. Including paper basically eliminates the tooling cost. And while it could be seen as kind of a cheat and a cheap alternative for a toy company that's spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on tooling, if they can throw in a few pieces of paper with some print on it, heck, to me, it all comes down to kind of the shake-and-bake model. And this really uh, shows how kids will treat paper product and what they want it to be when it comes to playtime. It's not fried. It's shake and bake. And I'll help. It's not so yeah, if you're going to give kids paper, it has to be to unleash their imagination. Buying them a toy, a plastic toy that also includes paper as a component, completely eliminates that imagination-based 
liberation, shall we say, where a blank piece of paper, a blank cardboard box to a child has unlimited potential. And that's what makes paper cool. I hope this video helped clarify what kids like about paper toys, cardboard toys, and, well, what doesn't work so much. Give a kid a cardboard box. You'll be amazed at how their imagination will be fueled to create unlimited potential. But sell them paper with an action figure? Not so much. I hope you enjoyed this video, and please do share it with others. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and thanks so much for watching.